My name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here at Way Down Wines with Pam Walden uh, of Willful Wine Company. Uh, it's April 26, uh, 2019, and we're going to start by asking you, uh, why wine? Why wine? Why wine? Mm, I got into it by accident. Um, I, um, I kind of was along for the ride and um, ended up uh, taking over the winemaking in 2011. So it was totally an accident. So tell us how that happened. How did that happen? Uh, well, when I was a kid, um, when I was a teenager, I thought I was going to be a concert pianist, um, and that didn't happen, um, funnily enough. Uh, so I, um, uh, I ended up studying English literature, going to work in TV production in London, um, and, and got the sack. Apparently that happens to everybody at least once. Um, and after there, I graduated to being a waitress um, in uh, a ferme auberge in the Dordogne. Um, and I met my ex-husband. <coughs> and uh, he was interested in making wine, so we moved to the States and uh, we started making, we made, he got a job and just started working his way up in the wine industry. You know, started as a seller rat and kind of worked his way up. And um, we made four barrels of our own wine in 2000. Um, just started small, just kind of, um, Grew every year and just kind of invested the money every year. Um, we sort of, you know, didn't take any wages, just kind of kept growing it bit by bit. Got up to about 8,500 cases in 2006. Um, we bought a property in the Dundee Hills and planted the first, uh, uh, planted the first seven acres of that in 2008. And then we split up in 2009 life happens mm -hmm. um, and uh, I took over um, the I became so I became a sole owner of the business and took over the winemaking in 2011 2011 is when I started the willful brand um, and it's uh, it's willful because I'm willful and so is Pinot Noir <laughs> um, and it I don't think if I hadn't been willful I probably would not have taken on the challenge and may not have made it either you know the first vintage, I crushed um, to 45 tons, no, 54 tons, the first vintage, 2011. I still didn't know how to cold stabilize or protein stabilize white wine. I learned that at Schmeckerton Community College, um, spring of 2012, as I was doing that on my wines, um, I would go to class <laughs> and I would learn how to uh, do fining or filtration and then I'd be doing it the next day. On my wines that were, you know, my commercial wines that were going to pay my mortgage. Sure, so sure. I said that it, it means that you listen really hard in class and you pay attention. So you were along for the ride at the start. At what point did it become something you were actually interested and passionate about? I was always interested in it. Um, so um, we crushed wine, the first two vintages, 2000 and 2001 at Medici Winery. Mm -hmm. Um, and Aaron was the assistant winemaker at Rex Hill at the time. Um, he, uh, so he couldn't be there, you know, um, until late in the day, until they'd finished their shift at Rex Hill. Okay. So I had to kind of monitor fermentations and I loved it. I remember we had some fruit from a couple of the archery summit vineyards and I would just hang my head over the fermenters and just breathe in the smell. Sure. And I loved it. I mean, it was, it's a very tactile. I mean, it's a, it's, you know, it's kind of, it's science, but it's also, it's, it's, I don't know, to me it sort of seems very intuitive and kind of, um, I, as well. So, um, yeah, I enjoyed it. I mean, I liked um, the challenge, you know, I had to learn how to weld. Um, I learned that wine, wine making is like 50% plumbing. Um, and, uh, and I like that. I like the practical aspect of things. Um, and um, so I always liked it. You know, I used to have to go to sample the vineyards, always enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. Um, I loved working when we had our own vineyard. I love that. I mean, my happy place is 6 a.m. on a sun, summer morning in the vineyard, um, getting a cup of tea before um, the sun comes up and be up there as soon as it light, it's light enough to work. I love that. Mm -hmm. I could do that all day just fine. Um, but, um, yeah, but then, and then I took over the winemaking 2011. I still wasn't sure... Um, whether I was going to be, I wasn't sure whether I was going to create a label from it. So I made the wine from the estate grapes in 2011. We planted seven acres. Um, I, we harvested seven tons, about a ton an acre, the first vintage. Um, and I dropped my ass off on those grapes. 2011 was a tough vintage, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was cool. Um, we'd uh, done a lot of additional canopy management. 
um, and uh, and I just couldn't bear the idea of giving them to somebody else to make wine with them on their my grapes, right? So um, so I figured, you know, how hard can this be, right? I mean, it's not like heart surgery, right? Sure. So it, so I and I done I felt good with some of it. Mm -hmm. um, so so I made the wine. Um, and and then wasn't sure until that summer whether I was going to follow through because I, I had to d just ask myself, it, am I just doing this to prove a point? <laughs> you know, is this just kind of uh, you know I can do it, or is the, or I, is this something that I actually want to do with my life? Mm -hmm. um, and I asked myself that question the whole time the wines were in barrel, and finally I just thought, you know, it's either that or go back to advertising. Um, so I became a winemaker. <laughs> when when you and Aaron met and you decided to go and he, he wanted to do wine, why did you end up in Oregon? Um, truthfully, um, we, uh, he was an amateur brewer um, and we came to Portland because there, at that point in time it was the, there was the largest percentage of microbreweries per capita and mm -hmm. so we wanted to have a little brew pub and um, we knew we wanted a business and I think the initial idea was we were going to have a little brew pub. Mm -hmm. So that was the plan, and we um, drove across the country with all of our belongings in a drive driveway. I think it was called where you drive somebody else's car across the country um, when they're relocating. You know, mm -hmm. so we did that and um, came here and didn't know anybody at all, and uh, found a nice room in a motel up on Sandy Boulevard that was really close in and really cheap, and obviously found out why. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then we rented a car and drove around the valley and, um, and realized that, you know, a lot of these people, they didn't have a, lot of, a bunch of money. You know, mm -hmm. they were doing it because they loved it. They started small. Um, and well, so we looked at them and thought, you know, hey, if they can do it, why not? Mm -hmm. And I knew that his first passion was wine, not beer, really. Um, and I said, you know, it's hard enough to start a business anyway. Um, if you're going to do something, do what you really want. So... Um, so we started, he got a job making, making wine, and we decided that was what we were going to do. Who, you mentioned that you went around and toured and found people and people who were doing something similar, kind of a bootstrap operation that you were kind of thinking of. Were there, and you had, didn't know anybody, did you meet people? Were there people who mentored you along the way or gave you encouragement early on, or were you kind of finding your way on your own? Oh, no, all along. I mean, it's the Oregon wine industry, you know? I mean, people are lovely at every stage in, in my life, you know, whether it was starting out, whether it was taking over the uh, winemaking in 2011 and needing, some, needing to ask a lot of questions, mm -hmm. um, whether it was when Aaron died. I mean, you know, this, it's a wonderful community. Mm -hmm. um, everybody's very nurturing, very supportive for the most part that I have not really found anything other than that. Mm -hmm. And it's what part of the reasons why I wanted to stay in the, in the wine industry in Oregon. If it was a different situation, maybe not, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but Oregon's wine industry is awesome. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, kind of learning the ropes. So what were the things that surprised you as you were taking, as you were taking your next step into like taking over winemaking and working in the vineyard? What were the things about working in wine that surprised you that you weren't expecting? Hmm, that's a tough question. Um, things that surprised me. Or challenges you didn't foresee. It was all challenging, really. I mean, so, um, and it was all a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know that there was anything I could single out okay. in particular. Okay. Um, excuse me for a second here. Um, when you purchased the land in Dundee, uh, what were you looking for? Why did you choose the, the land you, you guys eventually started on? So, um, we started to think about um, buying um, a piece of property, maybe, or maybe we would buy a house and, you know, buy a house for a couple of years and then may maybe sell that and buy a piece of property. Mm -hmm. um, and I drove down Highway 99 one day and Newburgh Realty had the sign um, up outside of it. It said 17.32 acres Dundee Hills. I thought, holy cow, that <laughs> says. Um, and, uh, and so we went and had a look at it, and it, um, it was, at the time, it was like 249 or 259,000 for this um, little house, and it was little, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and 17 acres. Um, 
and uh, we borrowed some money from Aaron's grandma for the down payment. We managed to get a 95% mortgage um, and got this place. Yeah. And what was special about it to you? What did, what did you like about the property? I remember walking up the hill for the first time and there was a beautiful meadow at the top. There were lots of, the, the eastern section had been uh, planted already. Mm -hmm. it, it was, the eastern section had trees on it. And at the top there was this kind of clearing and it was just like this private, beautiful sort of oasis. Um, and it always was actually. I mean, even after we cleared and we put vines, the top of the hill was always kind of my happy place, you know. That would be the place where I kind of go to for solace, reflection, mm -hmm. you know. Um, <clears throat> willful. Um, how is Pinot Noir willful? Um, it's um, it's a fickle grape. It's um, it can be. I, th I mean, you know, a lot of people say Pinot Noir is like a woman, right? Um, so um, and it can. It can be. You know. Feminine. I, I like to make Pinot Noir that is very feminine, mm -hmm. uh, and it's um, you know I don't think it should be big and burly and um, you know overly sort of grippy tannins. I think it should be feminine. It, it should be graceful and pretty um, and lighter weight. I mean I think that's the strength of Pinot Noir is that it is this beautiful sort of ethereal kind of thing. You know mm -hmm. that's got layers of complexity. Um, I guess like a woman, right? Um, and uh, but you know, on on a bad day, it can be a little pain in the ass too. Um, you know, you'll be at a tasting, and a wine that tasted great the week before suddenly is completely shut down and you know austere and sort of you know tight and um, yeah. So um, that can be annoying. Mm -hmm. um, and it's you know you you shipping it, you ship Pinot Noir. It seems like it sulks more than any other wine in which you ship it. Uh, so it's a little, it can be a little delicate and kind of fussy, you know, I've made some other varietals before and they just kind of do their job, you know, they ferment, they go into bottle and they're fine, but they're not often as interesting, mm -hmm. um, whereas Pinot Noir is, um, is harder to work with, I think, but it's just got so much more to offer when it's good. So that's the challenge that keeps you coming, keeps you making it, keeps you interested in it? Yeah, I guess so. Um, we mentioned other varietals. What else have you made and grown? What else interests you? I like Tempranillo. I've made Tempranillo a couple of times um, from Delfino Vineyard and um, I think they do a fantastic job with their grapes. Um, I just um, bottled some Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon on a blend that's 60% Merlot, 40% Cabernet Sauvignon from Delfino and the grapes were barely ripe. Um, and it's taken a while for the wine to kind of come around. Mm -hmm. um, it, it took 18 months in the barrel and I, after, straight after bottling, I tasted it and I thought, holy cow, there's no fruit in it. Um, it's just all tannin and there's nothing, you know, how is this going to age? And then I tasted a couple of days after the cork had been pulled and the fruit had come back and, um, and it was like, oh, this is exactly what I thought it was going to be. <laughs> oh, this is okay. Sure. You mentioned earlier as you were, you were sort of, like you mentioned, Chemeca, taking classes yeah. and, and then learning on the fly. Uh, at what point did you feel like you kind of knew what you were doing? Was there a moment? I do now. <laughs> <laughs> if, 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 that, if that's applicable at all. <laughs> at what point did I feel like I knew what I was doing? Um, I mean, it's, it's a challenge. Yeah, I used to produce TV commercials, mm -hmm. and I certainly got to the point where there were less surprises. You know, I'd, I'd seen the scenario previously and had a bigger toolkit in terms of how to mm -hmm. approach a problem. And it's the same thing with winemaking, you know. Um, I've, there's more things that I've seen now, but every vintage is different. Um, so, and that's what I like about it. Mm -hmm. it. There's new challenges every year. So I know more about what I'm doing. I have a better sense of how to address problems. Um, but I don't know everything yet, not at all. Why did you choose to be in Portland with an urban, an urban winery rather than somewhere else? Well, we sold the vineyard in 2013. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, for me, I was probably, we were going to go to an urban um, location. Um, and uh, I was a single parent. Um, it was a choice probably between McMinnville or Portland. Um, and I had more friends in Portland. And I figured the dating options were gonna be better. <laughs> True story. And you recently moved to this location. This is not your first location in Portland, is that right? No, I was at Southeast Wine Collective in 2013, 2014, um, and 2016. 
and then I've been here at Way Down Wine since 2017. What about this place appeals to you? I like this place because it's a big open box. It's um, really easy to configure it into working um, however you want to um, because it's, it's got a w really wide opening to the front. Um, and yeah, it's just, you can make it be whatever you need it to be depending on what task you're doing in the winery. Uh, also, there's only two people here, so communication is a really easy group text. Um, so that's helpful. And both of the guys that I'm working with are great. Mm -hmm. um, they're s s traditionally like Oregon wine, you know, like Oregon wine industry, they are supportive mm -hmm. and, um, and helpful. Yeah. What are the advantages you found to having a winery in Portland versus something in the Valley? What, and, what, and what are some of the challenges you have to deal with? <clears throat> The um, advantage to being in Portland um, is uh, it's convenient to get to. Um, I would be, uh, I mean harvest is fine, I'm in the winery all day during harvest, but outside of harvest if I've got just a little job that I want to mm -hmm. do, it was before it could take me two hours to get out to the valley depending on where I was going. Mm -hmm. um, so it's easy to get to the winery um, and um, what else? <coughs> It's easy. I, I do my own sales in Portland, um, so it's um, accessible for that. It's easy to be able to combine different, you know, I, I wear a lot of hats as a small business owner. So I can do some wine work and I can go do some sales and I can do some tastings by appointment and I can do it all in the same day because I'm here in Portland. Sure. Um, challenges are um, bottling. I am never going uh, to, I'm not going to bring a bottling tr truck to a small urban winery again because it's just too hard. And this is a pretty good location for it. I mean, there's room to back a truck up. Um, but um, so I, I take my bottling down to Castile Bottling in McMinnville um, and just ship the wine down there. And those guys are fantastic. Mm -hmm. And they bottle all the time. So I trust them, them trust that they're going to do a really good job with it. Sure. You mentioned sales. Uh, how do you? What, what do you focus on for sales? Are you are you looking at uh, mostly directly to consumer? Are you working on grocery stores and and distribution? Or what? What are you? What are you? Uh, how do you? I sell think your if wine? you're really flippant answer, right, and just say, yeah, will they buy it and will they pay me? <laughs> and that's really that's it, right? Um, so. Um, I don't have a tasting room, so without a tasting room it's very difficult to um, build consumer sales. I used to have a tasting room out in Dundee and having face-to-face -face interactions with people is really the way to be able to build a mailing list in a wine club and it's, it's challenging to do that without. Mm -hmm. um, and um, So I do focus somewhat on consumer sales but it's a smaller part of my business um, just because I'm one person um, and I have minimal resources and it's a lot slower to grow consumer sales and so I focus more on uh, distributor sales. Um, I have a great network of distributors um, and um, they've helped me to build my brand as well so I see them very much as partners in building my brand. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and then my wholesale sales in Portland I do myself mm -hmm. um, which is, uh, is a bit of a challenge to manage sometimes but I really enjoy the people that I work with. I like you know, nipping around Portland and visiting with some accounts that I've known for several years. Um, and I enjoy that. So I like doing it. And I've worked out how to do the things that I like to do. I was just going to ask, is there a favorite part of the job for you or a favorite time of year for you? Um, no. I like the fact that it's something different all the time, you know? Um, at the beginning of the year, the first sort of four months of the year is when I'm traveling to go see distributors. Um, I'm working to uh, um, to promote the brand out of state. Mm -hmm. In the summer, um, I'm trying to spend as much time as I can with my kids and then go around to see vineyards and work with the growers. Um, and that's always fun because I can take the dog and um, a couple of vineyards I'll go and do some additional fruit thinning so that's fun because I like to do that I like to be out in the vineyard mm -hmm. and then in the fall it's just everything switched to um, focusing on winemaking and that's nice because it means that I can focus a bit more just on one thing for a while mm -hmm. um, which is helpful sometimes you feel a little bit fractured when you're wearing so many hats True. You mentioned earlier your description of like what you're hoping for your Pinot Noir to be like. Uh, how would you describe your winemaking philosophy? What is it about? What is it about your wines that you want people to take away? Well, I have two brands. My Jezebel wines 
are about being fruit forward, approachable, easy, um, just nice, easy going wines to drink now. Um, they are wines for my sister. She doesn't really drink wine, but she would drink, you know, my Jezebel Blanc because it's easy. And it's not, and it's, but it's, it's not like they're, they're, they're still good wines, mm -hmm. they're balanced, you know, they've still got nice acidity, they've still got nice varietal character, um, but they're friendly. Um, whereas the willful wines are wines that you could, uh, um, yeah, I like, I like the idea that they're going to be structured. I mean, the, the idea with the willful wines is they should have some good acid, they should be structured so that you can sell them, you should be able to see how they develop over the next 10 to 15 years. Um, I also, with the willful wines, it's very much about terroir, um, and uh, my my goal is to work closely with the uh, growers and make the you know and get the best grapes that we possibly can, mm -hmm. and then really try to do as little as possible. I don't add yeast. I, I like to use native yeast, um, uh, particularly for Pinot Noir, um, and and just you know let them do their thing really. How did you, do you have an idea how you came about your philosophy as though you were kind of learning on the fly? Uh-huh. Um, I really just, I'm doing what Aaron used to do in the winery. He was, um, he liked to do a longer cold soak. And so his whole idea with tannin management was to do um, a long cold soak in an aqueous rather than an alcoholic environment. Mm -hmm. um, and so the idea, the idea is that you build um, fine grained, more elegant tannins. Um, so the wines have structure, um, but they're not huge, um, you know, monstrously tannic wines. I think that's a bit hard with Pinot Noir anyway. Um, but they tend to have be more sort of feminine tannins. So more, they tend to be more elegant tannins. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so I'll do as much of a cold soak as I can get away with. Usually at least a couple of weeks, I'll use dry ice um, to, you know, make sure there's no um, try, dry ice to keep the oxygen off the cap. I'll rake the cap over every. Um, every day um, and then move it to, and keep it around 50 degrees and then I move the uh, fermenters into the winery, um, let them come up to temperature and let them take off. Um, I've started doing um, more whole cluster fermentation which is not something that Aaron did a whole bunch of. Mm -hmm. um, I really like it as we're getting, well a couple of ways I've changed actually from the way that Aaron used to make wine. I do do the same cold soap as much as possible. Um, I use native yeast because I think that um, uh, you get um, a, just a much a more complex wine. You get a better expression of the terroir, mm -hmm. and you also get a better texture. And that's been you know, uniformly in the way that I've tasted other people's native fermentation. And, and there's just always a really sort of silky um, texture that you get with it. Um, I um, oh, I've started picking a little earlier. Aaron always used like hang on for as long as possible until the t tannins have completely uh, resolved. Mm -hmm. We get that the, you know I mean he um, I took up the winemaking in 2011. We've I started having warmer and warmer vintages since then. Sure. I think you um, lose more than you gain by letting the grapes hang that long. I don't want to make wine that's 14 and a half percent alcohol. I don't want to not Pinot Noir. Um, I don't want to drink it. So um, I'm starting to pick earlier. Um, and um, and pick when they're you know just ripe as opposed to waiting for completely resolved tannins. I don't mind a little bit of a green edge personally. I'm mm -hmm. okay with that. Um, I think it it adds a little. Um, I don't know. What do you say? A little I'm grip um, tension. Mm -hmm. I remember talking to Ben Castillo. He talked about tension in Pinot Noir, and I like the idea that Pinot Noir should have tension. Um, and what else? Oh, and whole cluster fermentation. Aaron didn't do a whole bunch of that. Um, I think whole cluster fermentation is um, particularly, uh, is, for me, it seems to be helpful for getting a little more expression and particularly um, nice sort of floral sort of aromatics, particularly in some of the riper vintages that we're getting. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Interesting. How do you choose where to source your grapes from? How do you build those relationships? Um, their approach, I, I source my um, grapes depending on um, people's philosophy about um, grape growing, for one thing. Um, are, are one, are they going to be pretty reasonable to deal with? Are they going to be pleasant to deal with? I mean, that's with any business interaction or friendship or relationship, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then um, uh, how, how, you know, if they're... Uh, natural winemaking and natural grape growing. Um, you know, I don't like anybody that's 
I prefer to go with live or organic as much as possible. Um, I like uh, vineyard sites that have naturally um, higher acidity. Mm -hmm. um, the wines are easier to manage in the barrels, um, and that's the kind of wine that I want to make as well. Um, I particularly like the Dundee Hills. I mean, having had a vineyard there, I mean, I have a soft spot for the Dundee Hills. Um, uh, Eola Hills I really like as well. I think Dundee and Eola go really well together. Um, and I like to make, you know, lighter, um, a little bit brighter acid, more feminine Pinot Noir. So I like to go with appellations that are going to, um, th that, will, that will match that. So. I don't want to diss any of Appalachians in particular, you know, like I don't really like Yamhill Carlton so much, I just tend to find it's a bit bigger tannin, so it's not to my style mm -hmm. personally. I mean, but the wines are good, it's just not my style personally, sure. you know. Sure, of course. Uh, you mentioned uh, you have a background in, in advertising and marketing. Uh, has that helped you uh, as you approach the, the like being, a, being a one woman business? Um, it has in terms of having to be a good problem solver, be able to manage budgets and people. Um, so just kind of general skills, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what do you hope for out of your, do you have a, a goal in mind for where Willful and, and Jezebel will be? Do you have a, a growth in mind or are you happy where you're at now? Or what do you see I when you look in the right. future? Um, <laughs> well, I don't know exactly. Um, you know, I'm, I've been sharing space for a long time. I like the idea that at some point I will have my own space, I think. But I'm also on the fence because that would also pin me down. Um, and I like the freedom of uh, not being kind of rooted to one spot. Um, I'd like to grow a little bit. I mean, I'm growing a little bit each year for sure. I'm just over 5,000 cases now. Um, but. Now I'm right at the point where I need to get some additional help if I'm going to grow the business much more. Mm -hmm. So, and it's expensive, so um, yeah, I guess I would like to grow a little bit more. Um, and I've also got to work out, you know, how I want to transition into being retired. I mean, I turned 50 last year, so um, I've got to work out, you know, what do I do after I get the kids through college? Um, Personally, um, I've wanted for the last two or three years to do um, a nonprofit organization helping homelessness. Um, and I, as soon as I am not involved as the, with the kids quite as much, I would love to work out how to put that in my life. It's not feasible right now. I have a business and I'm a single parent to two, two teenagers. Um, so I can't fit that in right now, but it's really important to me. And at, at some point, um, that needs to be part of my life. Sure. So. You mentioned being a single parent. Uh, what's it like being a woman in the wine industry? What's it like being a, a mom in the wine industry? Uh, it's fun during harvest, for sure. Um, you know, whoever my assistant winemaker is, it depends on if they're good or bad, they can make or break my harvest, for sure. Because I just get somebody temporary, I don't have a full-time assistant, so if I get a good assistant to harvest, it's great. And if they're not as good, it's way more challenging. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as a mom at Harvest, it's, I, have a, I used to have a full-time nanny, pretty much, a full-time nanny over Harvest. Um, I don't anymore. Um, my t kids have grown up, and last year was the first year where we tried things out without um, having a full-time nanny. We just had part-time help. Um, it's, it's challenging. Mm -hmm. It's really challenging to be working seven days a week. Mm -hmm. and. Um, have to still be the person that you know works out how to get dinner on the table seven days a week and make sure that they get their homework done um, and whatever else is going on with their lives and help juggle their social challenges and their personal lives and all the things that a mom does mm -hmm. um, and that's hard enough I think if you've got two parents and you're going through harvest mm -hmm. but if you're a single parent going through harvest and you're trying to manage all that it's it's a trip. <laughs> what about during the rest of the year? Uh, is it uh, how do you balance your your hats? Uh, as you as you mentioned, you you have a lot on your plate. Uh, how have you just sort of developed your 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 how to get through the year philosophy? Um. Well, um, I try and do the things that I'm good at. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't bottle my own wine. 
because I take it to Castile's, they're great at it, you know? There's no reason for me to do that and it makes no difference qualitatively. Um, I do, I produce my Jezebel wines down in Eugene mm -hmm. and it's, um, it's butt numbing to drive up and down I-5 during October. Um, but the rest of the year it makes life a lot easier and they do all my tank movements and I don't have to clean to big huge tanks anymore and I, um, I get to focus on the things that make the wine better mm -hmm. as opposed to just the kind of nit, nit, you know, nuts and bolts and nitty gritty things. Sure. So I try and focus on the things that are going to have an impact on the wine qualitatively and, um, and have less involvement in the things that aren't. Um, I try and make sure that I have time with my kids too. I try and make sure that I'm always at home for dinner mm -hmm. um, as much as possible. Um, so it's just balancing it, you know? Sure. Every day may not be balanced, but hopefully every week is, mostly. <laughs> sure. Uh, you mentioned off camera that you were not good at prognosticating the, the future of the wine industry, but I'm curious, let's talk about sort of the, the changes you've seen in Oregon wine since you've become part of the industry. What, is, what, is, what about it is different to you? What, is, what, is, what are the changes? Um, well, we started in 2000. There were 176 wineries, I think, and now there are over 700. Um, there are some much bigger wineries, and there's a lot of people from out of state now, you know, from France and from California. Mm -hmm. Um, but I guess, so, you know, there's, a, there's different, definitely different influences um, in the industry and it seems like it's matured for sure and becoming a little bit more, um, proper is not the word, um, not regimented, but um, I can't think of the word. Organized, established? Yeah, I guess it's more organized, it's more established, you know, it's not quite so mom and popish anymore. But it still feels like it's got a, a spirit of collaboration and support. And that's, I've, my, I've always hoped that for the Oregon wine industry, that as it evolves and as it matures, that it's still going to keep that, um, the essence of collaboration, which I think is just so key to Oregon winemaking. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that it's going to be harder in the future to be uh, the size you are of winery or easier, or will it not change at all? Do you foresee as influences are changing that this will make it harder to make 5,000 cases of wine a year? Um, I think, um, uh, I don't know. There's more competition for, for wine under $20 for sure. Um, and that's a big part of my business. Um, so, um, I mean, I like to make, you know, it's nice to make some wine that's a little bit more expensive and sort of, you know, special occasion wine but also I want to make wine just for everyday drinking you know wine that's affordable that my neighbors can buy mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's a little hard to make that when there's a lot you know there's more competition from some of the bigger companies when they've got um, they, they can you know their costs are limited uh, their, their costs are uh, they got whatever overhead uh, they got overhead split over um, you know whatever this the, over more scale sure yeah I think what you're saying you know what I mean. I'm just trying to find the words so you can actually be on camera. Oh well. Um, what do you see happening to the Oregon wine industry in the future then? Uh, do you see more of the same changes that we're seeing now? Or what do you see when you look 10 years down the road? I don't know. It's diversified so much. I mean, I'd never have thought of Portland uh, urban wineries, you know, even 10 years ago. I mean, they were. I mean, mm -hmm. Hip has been around for a, a while. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, and now there's a bunch of urban wineries and, um, you know, uh, it's, it seems like wine can be anything you want it to be. You know, I always thought that you had to have a vineyard and you had to be out in the valley um, and had to have a really fancy winery. And I remember coming to Oregon for the first time and realizing not necessarily that it, you, you know, you, d you didn't have to be that. And, and now it's even more so. Now you can just be making a few barrels here in, in Portland mm -hmm. and you're still a winemaker and you're still a legitimate winery and in fact um, I think people like that, They people like that accessibility mm -hmm. um, because it, it doesn't have to be this, you know, hugely, you don't need to be a wine snob to enjoy wine, it just, it's open to everybody and even the, you know, produ wine production part of things um, can be just as interesting um, to anybody. It's not very well articulated but yeah. You mentioned the Portland Urban Winery scene and how quickly it's grown. Recently, it's grown. Mm -hmm. uh, do you feel that they are f fairly cohesive? Are you kind of growing up together and leaning on each other, or, or is it? Uh, 
Uh, in Portland Urban Wineries Association, um, I think pretty much everybody that's making wine in Portland, most of them are kind of part of that group. Mm -hmm. um, and people certainly share information and there's some, you know, group tastings. So, I would say so. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's all the questions that I have scheduled for you, planned okay. for you. Uh, is there anything I should have asked? Anything you'd like to mention here at the end? Uh, open forum? <laughs> mm, I don't think so. Okay. Right. Yeah, not that I can think of. Well, thank you so much for your time and for your answers. Uh, and uh, we really appreciate it. And we'll go ahead and let you off the hook.